let's go over some of the most common misconceptions when it comes to ADA website compliance. And these are things that people continually get wrong to this day. And so I have a list of bullet points starting with the 15 employees exception. There, um, it, it, this is so pervasive, many, many people think that if you don't have 15 employees, that the ADA doesn't apply to you. They are thinking of Title I and not Title III. Title III is where all of this website accessibility litigation is coming from, or at least the, the great majority of it um, involves Title III. Title I, yes, it does have, an, uh, it does state that uh, it applies to entities with 15 or more employees, but that's for Title I, that's for accessibility in the workplace. And so that's that exception, and it's completely separate from Title III, but it does come first in sequence when we're looking at the ADA. So for a while, um, Google had a snippet, I don't think it still does, but Google snippet showed that initial um, Title I uh, when people were searching for 15 or more employees, ADA, ADA exceptions, et cetera. Um, and I've written an article on this, I will link to it below, but that is absolutely not true. The ADA applies to places of public accommodation, whether or not they have 15 employees. Think about it. Think about it in terms of a restaurant. Let's say there's a small restaurant. Um, if the restaurant does not have 15 employees, does it not need to make its uh, facilities accessible? No, it still needs to make its facilities accessible. And that is because it, a, it is a place of public accommodation. So yes, the ADA can definitely apply to small businesses with less than 15 employees. Another misconception, and, and this, is, this is bad, but people still think that they can install an overlay widget. So you may, might heard of this referred to as a plugin, an app, software, toolbar, menu, et cetera. The concept being that um, you can instantly install some type of widget uh, where a menu of settings are available and they can, uh, depending on what, what is chosen, they can render superficial adjustments to a website. Many people think these overlay widgets make their websites accessible. They don't. Uh, many people think that they make their websites ADA compliant. They don't. Many people think they prevent litigation. They don't. Um, these overlay widgets have done very well for themselves by um, by um, seizing upon the gray area in this space. Um, but what has become clear is that plaintiff's law firms do not, um, do not view overlay widgets as making a website uh, accessible and or ADA compliant. They, there, there are, um, I believe, at least 200 instances, and these have been documented instances where a website has had um, an overlay widget installed and nevertheless been sued. Um, and I will, uh, that is, uh, that uh, data is from overlayfalseclaims.com and I will also link to that in the description. Um, but also accessibility professionals, if there, if there is any accessibility professional with credibility, um, they will um, never recommend an overlay widget be installed for accessibility. Um, can an overlay widget uh, provide some type of nominal benefit where someone can render an adjustment um, that they would like on the website? Sure. If you want to install one just so that you feel better, um, that that's that possibility, that option is there. But it's important that you understand that overlay widgets do not make a website accessible. Why is that the case? Because they literally lay over the website. They don't make the content itself, the code itself accessible. And that is what is necessary for WCAG conformance. And that is what is necessary to follow best practices for uh, compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. So keep that in mind. It's a common misconception. People are still wasting their money um, to this day in buying these overlay widgets. Um, another uh, misconception is that there is an ADA compliance checker. There is no such thing. Um, there is no automated way to check for ADA compliance. Um, what this is getting confused um, is a scan. So there are scans available that will help uh, uh, flag potential accessibility issues. 
on a website and those scans are extremely helpful, but they don't check for ADA compliance. And even if you have a perfect score on a scan, it does not mean that the website is fully accessible. Scans are very limited in the number of accessibility issues that they can flag, um, but they are helpful tools to supplement any efforts when you are um, attempting to find accessibility issues. But they are not ADA compliance checkers. There are no ADA compliance checkers. Um, co also, compliant, there's this idea that compliance is impossible. Um, and it's true that we don't know exactly how um, to make a website ADA compliant because there is no formal legal precedent. However, the Department of Justice has taken numerous private enforcement actions um, specifically over digital accessibility and um, that has involved websites. And the DOJ has laid out exactly what um, what they think is necessary in these private enforcement, the, the settlements that result from these private enforcement actions. So the DOJ is the regulatory and enforcement agency behind Title II and Title III of the ADA. So given that, they are the authorities, literally, uh, when it comes to the Americans with Disabilities Act. And what we know what they have required of these entities. And so what they've required is conformance with the latest version of the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines or WCAG. And, um, and they've required an accessibility statement um, that offers at the very least a statement of commitment uh, along with um, contact methods for um, assistance, uh, a support with accessibility and uh, the, the, the ability to provide feedback. They've required other things, but those are, um, they required other actions, but those are the two keys to ADA compliance. So when you look at, um, you, when, you, when you think about, well, compliance isn't possible because we don't know what to do. Actually, um, if you want to follow best practices and you want to make sure that you are in compliance, there's really nothing else that anybody knows to do. So they're really, they're, even if I try to think of other things um, that could potentially make your website compliant. That's what ADA compliance comes down to. It comes down to accessibility and making sure that people have meaningful access to the content and the ability to engage and interact with the functionality of the website. So that's what ADA compliance really is at this point. At some, at, at, you know, in the future, we will see uh, we will see laws and uh, and possibly uh, we will see a law and or a regulation where we know exactly there will be a, what to do, there will be a formal legal precedent. But at this time, that's what ADA compliance amounts to. And so sometimes uh, when people are saying compliance is impossible, what they're really saying is that it's impossible um, to conform with the web content accessibility guidelines. It's not, it's just something that um, you have to be dedicated to and take action until you get to full conformance. Also, um, many people think that ADA compliant websites are ugly websites or making your website accessible uh, results in an ugly website or um, drastic changes that need to be made. That is not the case. We're only making the content accessible. We're not trying to change the content. We're not trying to change um, the, the, uh, the functionality. Rather, we just want to make sure the functionality is accessible. So if you think that your your website needs to tr look dramatically different after it, after it's accessible, it doesn't. Um, you may need to change, um, you know, th there are very few things that you would need to change. One could be color contrast, right? Improving the color contrast so that um, the text and the meaningful content has sufficient contrast against the background. Um, possibly the order of the content just to match the programmatic order, but that's all that's all up to you in what uh, what order it's presented. So there are very few changes. Your website will not be ugly um, if you make it accessible. Also, um, there's an idea, and this is perpetrated um, by sellers within the industry, that everything is constantly changing and we never know what's going on, and you need you have to have an expert at all times because you know, just so many things are in flux, and that's really not the case. Um, yes, there might be new court cases. Yes, there might be new regulations. But as I've as I've already said, what is necessary to make a website accessible is already known. 
there there isn't one thing that um, is true is there haven't there hasn't been a lot of change in uh, in a, in the in recent years. We might see uh, we what we've seen as far as major you know significant changes would be updates to the web content accessibility guidelines. So a new version has been released. And I think the biggest change is in 2018, um, WCAG 2.1 uh, was released. And that was significant because it added additional success criteria onto 2.0. So nothing was undone. If you had made your website 2.0 conformant, you were still good. It was just additional considerations were added. Uh, but when it, and then some other litigation uh, in California now, uh, online only businesses can no longer successfully be sued. So that was something in favor of defendants. But uh, for the most part, this isn't a constantly changing space. It's just that people are constantly creating confusion. So when it comes to constant changes, if you follow best practices for ADA compliance right now, you're going to be compliance in the future with any uh, laws or regulations that are that come out in the US and also internationally. There may be other things required for material, uh, for material compliance, but when it comes down to actually making your website accessible and being in compliance with the law, if you are in conformance with the web content accessibility guidelines, particularly the latest version of it, and that could be 2.2 whenever it does come out, um, then You've done you've done all you can do. There are things there are additional things you can do, but in terms of the law, the law is very likely it's ninety I'm ninety nine point nine 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 percent sure the law will never go uh, require beyond what is required in the web content accessibility guidelines. So things aren't constantly changing. It's not that confusing. It's been straightforward for a long time, and my recommendation on how to make a website ADA compliant. Is going to remain the same. There, there aren't going to be a lot of changes, no matter what happens in the court. Um, if there, if there was something monumental, it would likely be that a law passed or a new regulation uh, came forth from the DOJ, and that regulation just set formal precedent on the requirements that we already now are following. So it would be something like, you know, WCAG conformance is required. Okay, we're, we're already WCAG conformant and nothing would change. So um, these are some common misconceptions and uh, people get them wrong over and over again. And they're, they're just working from um, something that they read quickly or that they heard from someone else, uh, but they don't, they, their information is, is, is wrong. So the one I see so common is the 15 employees exception. So many people are echoing this. And I think it's in part because Title I uh, comes first and, and that uh, most people read that first and then immediately think that they um, are exempted. And then another problem is I've actually seen this wrong on law firm websites. So there are some law firms that also read too quickly and did not understand um, the law in this case. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is overlay widgets are pervasive and, and the, the sooner they die out, the better.